Welcome to the PA Books Podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, James Hessler and Brett Eisenberg, authors of Gettysburg's Peach Orchard. Our guests on PA Books today are Britt Eisenberg and James Hessler, and they are the authors of this book, Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Longstreet, Sickles, and the Bloody Fight for the Commanding Ground along Emmitsburg Road. James Hessler, we'll start with you. Why is it commanding ground? Well, it was considered commanding ground uh, by two of the principal generals who were engaged in the action, Union General Dan Sickles and Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Uh, both of them considered the area to be important for artillery, and part of our story then is figuring out where they write. So a little bit of the basics about it, where is it? So Gettysburg's Peach Orchard is about a mile and a half south of the town of Gettysburg. Um, it was owned by the uh, Scherfee family um, since the uh, 1850s. Uh, it's a four-acre orchard, kind of crowns the crest of this uh, low-running ridge that goes right through the center of the battlefield. And the Scherfee family had been so successful that they had actually planted another six-acre orchard just to the north of it with the hopes of um, prospering even more. Uh, that's one of the things we like to point out in the book is that for the same reason the Scherfee family chose uh, to have their farm on this ground uh, in some ways uh, is the same very reason that the commanders thought it was a good place to have an right. artillery uh, platform. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's good ground in a number of different regards and civilians and military leaders often make those same uh, distinctions when trying to figure out uh, what ground is best. And we so. think we think that's one of the things that makes our book unique is the way we intermingle the civilian aspect of this with the military. Yeah. You know, a lot of times it's sort of one or the other when you do these Gettysburg or history books, and we try to make the civilian story maybe not as important as the military part of it, but you know, an important component of it too, as Britt said. Certainly. What makes it good ground? Well, from a military point of view, it's elevation. Now, it's not the most elevated point on the Gettysburg battlefield, and that leads to some controversy later. But the Peach Orchard, it's kind of broad, and it's flat, and it's open, and Civil War commanders needed that to place their artillery batteries. Yeah. the standard today, does mm -hmm. it seem like high ground? Uh, you know, I, oftentimes when I'm doing a tour, I like to ask folks as we're coming up to the Peach Orchard, what do you think of this ground? Yeah. Does it look like it's, it's uh, valuable? And the first comment they always make is, well, it is slightly elevated. You know, we've been talking about high ground on our tour right. for the last hour, so it is elevated. It must be somewhat uh, useful. Uh, but I think we make a pretty strong argument in our book that although it's elevated terrain, it's some of the most deceptive elevated terrain on any battlefield, maybe in the Eastern Theater of the Civil War, uh, because it's kind of like an island that floats between these two battle lines uh, on its own. And um, the one person who recognized that is the one person who had a better vantage point, General George Meade. From Cemetery Hill, he could look to the south and see that this terrain was floating mm -hmm. between both lines and didn't necessarily maybe have the most military value. Um, for that reason, it's neutral ground, as he says to General Sickles in their confrontation at the uh, at the orchard. But um, yeah, so how did it come to be significant? Well, it starts on the morning of July 2nd, 1863. Uh, one of the key protagonists in our story, Union General Dan Sickles, decides that he likes the Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road as a position for his troops better than the one that his commanding officer has ordered him to be in. So General Sickles moves his troops without orders into this ground, and then when the Confederate attack under General Lee and General Longstreet begins later that afternoon, they're going to have to basically fight for this for this ground. And that, that's what makes it significant, some of the bloodiest and most important fighting of the Battle of Gettysburg. But when, you know, Britt and I are both battlefield guides, and when you come to Gettysburg, 
Pittsburgh, you think Little Round Top, yeah. you think Pickett's Charge. You don't think of the Peach Orchard. You know, it's kind of one of those side lights that you're just driving through on your way to somewhere else. Yeah. And what we're trying to change with our interpretation, Brian, is this notion that it's a critical part of not only the Union defense on July 2nd, but the Confederate attack on both the second and the third day. And that's going to, again, just turn it into um, uh, a really important, messy, bloody part of the uh, of the battle. I, I think that's in some ways ironic, too, because uh, even with some of our colleagues, I think you could argue when, when you say, um, you know, the peach orchard is the most important piece of ground, let alone when you say it on a tour yeah. uh, with folks that might be from any state uh, in the country. Um, or around the world, uh, you know, the peach orchard's more important than the little round top. How dare you say something <laughs> like that? Um, in, in reality, the only person who had little round top as part of their battle plan that day was George Meade, and he was not necessarily expecting to use it, but because he expected Sickles to be in position uh, from Cemetery Ridge down towards little round top. Nobody had plans of fighting on little round top itself when the sun came up on the morning of July the 2nd, 1863. Yeah, uh, the peach orchard is the opposite of that. Though. Right, <laughs> and, and one of the things we talk about in the later chapters of the book is how the interpretation of this has changed over mm -hmm. time. During the battle, looking at the contemporary reports of the officers involved, it's very obvious that the Peach Orchard, the Emmitsburg Road area, was a significant part of the Confederate battle plan and inadvertently a significant part of the Union defense. But over time, as the veterans came back and battlefield visitors came back, more and more of that focus shifted to things like Little Round Top, high ground, vis vis you know, visually prominent and appealing, um, and, it, and people just started going somewhere else. And we're trying to bring them back to the yeah. Peach Orchard and say, wait a minute, this is, it was a confusing battle, but this is an important part of how the battle was fought. It's the eye of the storm yeah. on July yeah. the 2nd, 1863. Every, every action that occurs on the second day of the battle is a spin-off in some way of the decisions made about the Peach Orchard, uh, it, the ground that the Peach Orchard sits on, um, all the way over to Culp's Hill on the night of July the 2nd. Um, it all comes back to that one focal point. And, the Peach and then so. even from there, even into July 3rd, yeah. General, Lee's, General Lee's subsequent de decision to launch Pickett's Charge on July 3rd comes because by the end of the second day, his troops are in the Peach Orchard. So it all flows from the second day into the third day. There might not be a Pickett's Charge as we know it today had, had this action not occurred. Well, if Meade's plan was to have everybody along Cemetery Ridge and uh, to the, the little round top, how did it <laughs> well, that's the Sickles problem, right? So, uh, you know, I've been on this program before discussing some of my biographical yeah, work. Yeah, talk with, a little bit about yeah, uh, so, Dan Sickles. So Union General Dan Sickles, the uh, most controversial and probably the most hated individual at the Battle of Gettysburg among historians and enthusiasts uh, today. Somebody at home right now is just getting angry <laughs> that we're even talking about Sickles. But Dan Sickles was a former congressman and attorney from New York City, uh, had probably gained notoriety prior to the Civil War, uh, because in 1859, while he was a congressman in Washington, he had murdered his wife's lover on the streets of uh, Washington, assembled this legal dream team, uh, which got him off with the first successful case of temporary insanity ever used in United States court history, uh, or at least recognized as such. There's some debate about that. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, I think we mentioned in the intro, Britt and I are both battlefield guides at Gettysburg. For many years, I used to refer to Dan Sickles as the O.J. Simpson of Gettysburg, yeah. <laughs> but now you get people on battlefield tours who don't know who O.J. Simpson was, yeah. and that's just really, really confusing to get into. So anyhow, to get back to your question, um, Sickles, Sickles and George Meade have very different backgrounds, and they don't get along, and they don't really communicate well together. George Meade is the West Pointer, the professional general. Dan Sickles is a political appointment from the streets of New York. So the bottom line is, on the morning of July 2nd, General Meade's got this intended, what we call today, fishhook defense on, little, on Cemetery Ridge. Little Round Top would have been the left flank of that fish hook. But Sickles, from his vantage point, thought the elevation, the open, flat ground in and around the Peach Orchard, Sickles, from his vantage point, thought that would have been better terrain than the ground that he was ordered to hold. And because of that, he moves his troops forward without orders from General Meade and ultimately brings on um, a patchwork defense on the Union side of the field. I want to read what you have in your book. You say, Sickles inquired if he had discretion to post his command according to his best judgment. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Certainly, Meade replied, within the limits of the general instructions I have given you, any ground within those limits you choose to occupy, I leave to you. So yeah. was Sickles insubordinate or was he taking initiative? <laughs> oh, the great question. You want to answer this, Jim? Uh, or yeah, how, many, how many hours do we have? <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> look, Sickle, Sickles is a polarizing personality. Um, no doubt about it. No doubt then and now. Um, if you are predisposed to hate Sickles, um, you know, we often say he's three things you hate rolled up into one guy. He's a New Yorker, he's an attorney, and he's a congressman. So if you're predisposed to hating Sickles, you're going to say, yes, he's insubordinate. I believe, and people are free to disagree with me, but I believe, based on years of research, which I'm happy to document in books, um, I believe that Sickles was probably more confused than insubordinate. That yep. doesn't mean he was looking, it doesn't mean he wasn't kind of looking for a way to do his own thing, because Sickles is the alpha male who does his own thing, but I think he's more confused than insubordinate. And, and I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, there, there's an assumption from many people who come to the battlefield when you look at the ground and you go up and stand on Little Round Top today. Well, Sickles, how right. did he not see the, the vantage point that this was and the importance uh, in terms of defensive terrain? We don't have any evidence that shows Sickles himself ever went up to Little Round Top uh, when he was at Gettysburg. Now, it doesn't mean he didn't, mm -hmm. but we don't have proof <clears> he did. And certainly his headquarters were about a mile further to the north on the morning of July the 2nd. Um, you know, when you take into account possible atmospheric uh, conditions on the morning of day two, does he even see Little Round Top? Who knows? Uh, his troops are camped, certainly, uh, at the north base of Little Round Top. Certainly there are soldiers in the Third Corps who, who recognize it because they write so afterwards. But when they came to the battlefield on July the 1st, 1863, um, they come right up the Emmitsburg Road. And uh, Sickles' Third Corps turns to the east or turns to the right at the Peach Orchard, and they go into their encampment. Um, Sickles' orders coming to Gettysburg were to guard the roads leading to the west over the mountains to make sure that the enemy doesn't use those roads as an incursion. Well, not only is the Peach Orchard elevated, but one of those roads goes directly west over the summit of that hill mm -hmm. into the teeth of the Confederate line. And I don't think that that was far from his mind on the morning of July the 2nd. Uh, the other thing is... You know, uh, and, and people will debate about this, but on the morning of day two, John Buford's cavalry, everybody knows them from the first day of the battle. Uh, they're in position at the Peach Orchard, screening the left flank of the army. And they're ordered away uh, to Westminster, Maryland to refit with supplies and ammunition after everything they had done. So now you have a non-professional soldier who's already concerned about the terrain, who doesn't have any screen. The curtain's been pulled up. And it's certainly, in his opinion, and even when we look at the other side of the coin, and Robert E. Lee and General James Longstreet, um, it's what they view as a valuable piece of terrain for artillery. Mm -hmm. So let's take advantage of it now, ask questions later before the enemy <laughs> uh, uses it to their advantage. Right, so I think you're right. And, and, you know, if I could add, Brian, uh, we are all factors of our past experience. Mm -hmm. You know, the decisions we make are based on past experience and historical figures were were exactly the same. Uh, we s kind of start the book at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May of 1863 because at that battle, uh, Sickles' troops had been ordered to withdraw from a peach orchard-like position that's referred to at Chancellorsville as Hazel Grove. Sickles had pulled his troops out of that position. Confederate artillery had later come in and basically pounded the Union Army out of their lines at Chancellorsville. So there's also a general belief that on the morning of July 2nd, uh, maybe rather than being insubordinate, Sickles has got this memory of Hazel Grove and kind of saying, you know, I'm going to prevent that from happening. And rather than pulling back from it, I'm going to move forward and kind of, uh, you know, take matters into my own hands before the Confederates put their cannons into that position. What did Sickles' troops think of him? They, they for the most part, loved him yeah. by all accounts. Yeah. Um, and I think that's another important point to make is these soldiers in the Third Army Corps, which Sickles commands, uh, they're veteran troops, everyone. Uh, they've been through a number of battles to this point. As he mentioned, at Chancellorsville, they suffer the highest number of casualties of any unit serving in the Chancellorsville, uh, and any corps serving in the Chancellorsville area. Um, and by all accounts, they, they admired Sickles. Uh, maybe not necessarily for his political past, but one thing nobody can deny is that Dan Sickles was a brave man. I mean, he, uh, he certainly... <clears throat> 
put his money where his mouth was uh, when it came to acting on the battlefield. And I think, yeah. you know, any soldier w w would admire that. Even today, when we look at 2019, the, the example that's set is, is what these subordinates look up to and, uh, and try to emulate. Which, which, to me, is part of the fascinating appeal mm -hmm. of the Sickles story, because you have a man who, was, don't get us wrong, he was controversial in his own lifetime, and he had his supporters and his detractors, but... As Britt said, his men admired him and loved him. And over time, in the ensuing 156 years, somehow America lost Dan Sickles yes. to the point today where, again, if the majority of Gettysburg enthusiasts, 90 percent of your Gettysburg enthusiasts, really somewhere between hate and despise the man. And to me, that's fascinating. You knew the guy, if you knew the guy and mm -hmm. loved him, and now we have future generations that obviously didn't know the guy, uh, despise him. And to me, that's just sort of fascinating how the history of this changes over time. History is not it, static. It changes, yep. and that's what makes it interesting. Especially since the Third Corps is largely annihilated at Gettysburg. You know, some people would have the tendency to say, well, right. how could you love a commander that... He got uh, his men killed, yeah. you know, that kind yes, of thing. Yes, but it's it, not it true. never really yeah. wavers. Yep. It never wavers. Yep. Until the, the day he died. Yep. Until the day he died. They were Sickles men. Yep. Did, did, did you two ever disagree on things when you were putting this book together? Not yeah, once. Yeah, all the time. No, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> there, there we go. Uh. Um, well, could, so maybe I could start by just talking about how this came together, yeah. and then we could talk about that. I am... Um, um, you know, my Sickles at Gettysburg book was came out in two thousand and nine. Um, Britt, you did you did your regimental history, the hundred and fifth Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, two thousand sixteen. So, out. so we knew we had kind of this mutual interest on that part of the field. But I had stories that didn't quite make it into my Sickles book. They were out of scope. He had stories that didn't make it into his regimental history or out of scope. So we, we both kind of realized, hey, we've got a simpatico here, yeah, yeah. Uh, a similar way of looking at this and saying, you know, this is an important and underrated part of the field. And from there, you know, it kind of just came together. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, when it, came, when it comes to the actual battle action itself, for the most part, tactically, strategically, we... We agree on a lot. Yeah, you know when it, there there are always differences when it comes to, uh, you know, was this cannon here or was this right, cannon here? Right. But the truth is, we don't know the answers to those right. questions. So right. you don't get in pitch debates over no. When Longstreet went up Emmitsburg Road, <laughs> this is what he was going to do. Well, well. You, well, because we're mostly in agreement, but do we get in pitch debates with other folks? <laughs> yes, yeah, all the yeah, time. yeah. And you know, my my take is, uh, you know, I've been a battlefield guide now since 2003. Brit's a battlefield guide. My take now is, you know, we've got these books, we've got our sources documented. You can challenge us to a fight, but man, just bring your footnotes to the fight. That's the, so, that's the key. Because, you know, people get sort of these verbal sort of, well, I remember so-and-so told me this, and half the time that's half-baked yeah. and, and not always accurate. So yep. so we don't get in fights. Yeah. Uh, we haven't decided where we're going to go for lunch today, but right. we don't get in fights. You know, think about this. He's yeah. a Yankees fan, and I'm a Red Sox that's fan. We're yeah. still together yeah. after and all and of still this. So. Together, so. <laughs> well, speaking of footnotes, you have a lot of footnotes in yeah. this book, and a lot of them read like... Text and mm -hmm. not like Ibid and Opsit and things like well, that. Good. How did you decide what to put in a footnote <laughs> and not just to include it in the text of the book? <laughs> With great difficulty. Uh, I mean, yeah. you know, the truth is, if, if all of our footnotes were part of the text, the book would be 800 pages long, and nobody would want to read it because yeah. it's just too it's just too big. But uh, part of part of well, going back to what Jim just said. Um, when it came to writing this book, we wanted to make sure that we had the documentation there. And I think one thing that annoys both of us when we read uh, books on Gettysburg or Civil War in general, history in general, is when you're reading a story and then you have to flip to the back of the book to see the note mm, back there right. and then you've lost that's your, right. it just messes with your train of thought. That's so right. we wanted to have the evidence right there so people could not only read the, the narrative but see that evidence we've laid forward um, without losing their spot. Yeah. And um, we cut a lot of footnotes. We, yeah. we cut a fair amount of text, too. Um, luckily, when Jim and I get depressed, we can go back and read all of that right. great stuff. <laughs> well, you know, hopefully, and hopefully at this point, the viewers at home aren't going, oh, they're talking about footnotes. Yeah. How exciting. You know, <laughs> right. you know, let's turn on the Teamster meeting or something. <laughs> but, but, but to Britt's point, you know, when we're writing the book, our scope is specific. 
the Peach Orchard, the Emmitsburg Road, that impact on the Battle of Gettysburg, and our two protagonists on the cover. We've talked about Sickles, James Longstreet is our other protagonist. During sort of the editing and the review process, you know, people would say, well, you know, you didn't talk about Pipe Creek. <laughs> well, you know, Pipe Creek isn't in scope, but we did put what I think is a heck of an interesting footnote together on yeah. it for the person who might want to know how did Pipe Creek kind of yeah. tie into all of this. Yeah. And that's sort of how you decide what goes in and what goes out. Well, speaking of Longstreet, the other protagonist on your cover, yeah. I learned he finished 54th out of 56 <laughs> yep. at uh, West Point. Yeah. Uh, what was his goal or Lee's goal on the second day? Yeah, so, so when, when, uh, when Sun comes up on day two and Lee and his staff officers are up near the seminary west of Gettysburg, uh, of course, they're looking over a map. Um, they've had a great success on July the 1st, they believe. They've driven the Union soldiers from the field in their backyard, on, on their turf. And how do we keep that initiative going? How do we move forward? Um, if Lee is beginning to understand that Cemetery Hill and some of the high ground on the other side of Gettysburg was what they fought for on July the 1st, he certainly can't make a direct assault because of the town of Gettysburg itself. It's in his way. Um, so he sends staff officers riding about to try to figure out where the Union flanks are at. And of course, there's a lot of controversy with, it, with even one of those rides. Um, but they said Johnston? Johnston's yeah. ride. I was yeah. hoping he wasn't going to say it. No. <laughs> um, but they settle on the fact that the Union left flank or the Confederate right towards the vicinity of the round tops uh, is the vulnerable place. Now, going back to previous interpretations, um, and Jim and I have talked about this many times, when I first started coming to Gettysburg, uh, when I was going through the guide process, one of the questions that people always gloss over, they just say it without necessarily having sources is, well, Lee believed the end of the Union line was somewhere today about halfway down Cemetery Ridge in the vicinity of the present-day Pennsylvania Monument. And, you know, one of the things when we were writing this book is, you know, that's kind of an important thing. Where does Lee believe this to yeah. be? Because that's how you formulate your attack plans. And can we even answer that question? Right. Because, quite frankly, there was a lot of confusion in the immediate aftermath from the participants. And if they couldn't answer it 156-odd years ago, can we even do that today? Right. But he, but he does, both Lee and Longstreet, make clear in their official reports that they're trying to gain a piece of elevated terrain that they can utilize to, uh, to, to get at the higher ground beyond, which of course would be Little Round Top, Big Round Top, Cemetery Hill. Um, and the only piece of elevated terrain in their front uh, to their right would be the Peach Orchard, the Emmitsburg Road Ridge. And when you look at the information Longstreet has given to, to make his attack, there's some disagreement about that between Lee and Longstreet. Um, the plan is to move up the Emmitsburg Road to the north, attack up the Emmitsburg Road and hit the enemy flank, drive that flank in all the way up past Cemetery Hill. The only way to do that is to, to capture the, the peach orchard, that high elevated terrain along the Emmitsburg Road. So, and Lee, and Lee, Robert E. Lee says that very explicitly mm -hmm. in his battle report. He says in front of Longstreet, the enemy held commanding ground that we thought we could use to bring our artillery to bear. He says that very specifically. So there's no doubt that a major part of the objective is for Longstreet to capture the Peach Orchard, capture the Emmitsburg Road, put your artillery there, and then converge fire onto Cemetery Ridge. There's no doubt about that. Was Sickles and his troops already there at the Peach Orchard? Well, they're, when they're starting to. So what happens is um, Sickles moves out from Cemetery Ridge to the Peach Orchard mid-afternoon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. You know, you can quibble about the exact time. When, while that's going on, Longstreet is navigating his troops through the back country, trying to get into position to launch this attack. Longstreet doesn't get into position to begin his attack, probably till about 3.30, 3, 3.30 in the afternoon. By that point, for the most part, Sickles and his troops are on the Emmitsburg Road Ridge, and Longstreet tells one of his subordinate commanders, General Lafayette McClaws, uh, you know, how are you going to go in? And McClaws says, well, that depends on what's in front of me, and Longstreet says, Nothing is in front of you. You are entirely on the flank of the enemy. 
Wrong answer. Yeah. Well, Sickles and his guys are there, and what's going to happen then is Longstreet is going to have to make some quick and fairly significant troop modifications on the fly because Sickles has moved forward. For better or worse, Sickles has moved forward, has disrupted the Confederate plan of attack. They're is not, the, not going to go up the Emmitsburg Road like they thought. Is that why the countermarch happened? The countermarch happens because as so they're... That's basically turn around and go back where you came from? Yeah, because as they're moving down through those fields behind what is Seminary Ridge, there comes a point where um, McClaws and, um, and uh, Johnston, who's with them, they see a Union signal station up on Little Round Top. So they reason, well, hey, if I can see them, they must be able to see me. And the whole purpose of, of the movement uh, was to be in com complete concealment. So if, if they blow that cover... Um, what does that say to the, to the enemy? You know, uh, interestingly, the, the signal station on Little Round Top reports to Army headquarters that there is a large body of troops moving towards our right, moving in the opposite direction. So they must have seen part of that column actually in countermarch. In some ways, you could argue it yeah. maybe helps Longstreet a little bit. But um, certainly the clock is ticking. And that's disadvantageous to yeah, the Yeah, and, and, and what the countermarch is doing is chewing up time. Yep. So while it's taking time for Longstreet to get his men into position and Sickles is moving forward to the Emmitsburg Road, more and more the Union left flank is no longer resembling what Longstreet thought it was going to look like when he started the countermarch. Yeah. And that's, to, me, that's, Brent, to me, that's one of the reasons why the second day at Gettysburg is just so enormously confusing to people, you know, because you have Meade, Meade thinks his, his line is going to look like this. Sickles has other ideas. Lee doesn't understand where the left flank is. Longstreet doesn't like it. Longstreet takes time to get into position. Sickles has moved forward. It doesn't look like what anybody thinks it's going to do. And, you know, you put all of that into a blender, and that's what makes the second day at Gettysburg yep. really so chaotic and yep. confusing to people. I mean, so there's the one thing we can, I think, completely agree on is regardless of how you feel about Dan Sickles, the movement of the Third Corps out to the Peach Orchard completely disrupted mm -hmm. everybody's plans that yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. which lo love them or hate them, it clearly makes it one of the most significant, if not the most significant, command decision of the Battle yes. of Gettysburg. Well, at some point, you have um, Captain Meade, is the son of General yes, Meade, staff officer. brings a, a instructions to, to Sickles. Yeah. What do the instructions say? So... So backing up a little bit, sometime between the night of July 1st into the morning of July 2nd, Sickles seems to have received verbal orders that say to the effect, put your troops in a position, extend the left of the 2nd Corps, essentially down Cemetery Ridge, and occupy that range of hills at the end of the ridge. Part of the confusion probably lies from the fact that nobody is referring to it as Big Round Top, Little right. Round Top. And that makes a difference, you know, because there's a little bit of imprecision in, in these verbal orders. So from that point, Sickles, or Captain Meade goes to Sickles on the morning of July 2nd. Uh, General Meade is said to Captain Meade, look, go to Sickles and find out if he's in position. Captain Meade rides out to Sickles' bivouac. Sickles is in his tent. He's sleeping late. Um, but Captain Meade meets up with Sickles eventually, and uh, Sickles says, you know, I'm not really sure where I'm supposed to be. Captain Meade isn't really sure what, what to do about that, so he rides back to his father. Now, remember, General Meade, for all of his wonderful attributes, uh, has a little bit of a temper on the job. You know, they call him the old snapping turtle, yep. and somebody said he was like a firecracker, always going bang at, at somebody. So you can kind of imagine General Meade probably isn't really happy with uh, to hear that news. So General Meade tells his son for a second time, go to Sickles, tell him to extend the left of the Second Corps, occupy the range of hills, replace some 12th Corps troops who had been there the night before, all of that. Basically the same thing again. And once Captain Meade rides to Sickles for a second time, now it's, you know, the game is on. So Sickles has been told twice where he's supposed to be. Sickles has said to Captain Meade twice, I don't get it, I don't like it, and that's just going to set up this whole collision course, which is going to result in this spectacular failure to communicate. Did he really not get it, or was he just blowing off the kid? Uh, I, 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 I really believe he, did, he didn't get I it. I think so, too. Um, especially because of his concern about that elevated terrain out along the Emmitsburg Road, where, where, where most of his troops were bivouacked. We call it the Sickles Hole in the book. There's a, there's yeah. a picture that shows you the view looking west. Uh, there's a wooded, uh, an area of woods only about 150 yards to the front, so we can't use artillery down there to any effect. Um, 
And again, he can't see anything that's up there along that Emmitsburg Road Ridge. So if indeed there are Confederates coming up from the south, which theoretically there shouldn't, but they may, uh, more importantly, the road leading to the west, the Wheatfield Millerstown Road, he can't see any of that from that hole. So um, again, let's, let's occupy that, take control of that. Um, and if the general's really unhappy with this decision, mm -hmm. we'll deal with the consequences. Yeah. Uh, after you, you know keep in mind sickles has no motivation to blow off the kids so to speak right. he doesn't have any motivation to do that um you know there's been ridiculous interpretations over the years that while well, sickles wanted to be president and somehow this was going to get him into the white house i mean nonsense like that but you know it is it is relevant to remember that Sickles himself actually makes a ride to Army headquarters right. later that morning at about 11 a.m. and says to General Meade, look, General Meade, uh, I've got some issues. You know, I've got issues where you've where you've positioned me. Can you come out and look at my position? General Meade says, no, too busy. I can't. Uh, so Sickles then says, could you bring Chief Engineer Warren out here? Again, Meade says, no, too busy, can't. Um, and then finally, the chief of artillery, a general by the name of Henry Hunt, kind of enters the room and Sickles says, well, can you bring out General Hunt and uh, we could benefit from his knowledge in disposing of the artillery? And Meade says, yeah, General Hunt can come. So if you want to accept, and you can, and there's going to be people at home who are going to accept that, and I can't change their mind, and I'm not trying to change their mind, but if you're going to accept that Sickles is just kind of, um, you know, hell-bent for leather to go out and do whatever he wants, um, you've got to kind of explain to me, to my satisfaction, why then did he go to headquarters asking for assistance? Right. Why did he do that? And really nobody has ever satisfactorily changed my mind on that. And, and trying to be as, as unbiased as possible. I mean, I'll say flat out, I'm, I'm a huge George Meade fan. What he accomplishes at Gettysburg is, is remarkable. But, um, you know, five separate communications go back and forth, whether it's Sickles in person or George Meade's son going to Sickles headquarters. There's no doubt that Meade's concern was his right over towards Culp's Hill yeah. that morning. Uh, but this is one place where, as the Army commander, when you get that many uh, pleas, the repeated calls for, for what am I supposed to be doing here, maybe it's a situation where Meade himself, you know, if we're going to point fingers comes down and is a, provides some clarity, you know, yeah, instead no, of sending the... Yeah, no, there's a Sickles critic at home who's going to, you know, ready to put their foot through the yeah. TV <laughs> and is going to say, look, how hard was it for him to understand that order? Well, that's really not the relevant right. point because clearly it was hard for him to understand the yep. order. And the relevant point is, could more attention have been paid to the union left and would that have potentially um, discourage this from happening. I don't want to give people the wrong idea. I mean, the book is not just about Meade Sickles right. stuff. Frankly, I covered a lot of that in my earlier Sickles book, but obviously this is a key decision that's going to lead to the story that we're trying to tell yep. and the combat that ensues at the Peach Orchard because of that. When Meade found out what Sickles had done, what did he do? He had just called a council of war at his headquarters, and um, Sickles was, was on his way from his line towards... Meade's headquarters behind Cemetery Ridge, and Meade had just been informed by his chief engineer of this move, uh, and as he's coming out, he sees Sickles approaching, and he says, sir, don't dismount. Um, your men need you more than I. I'll follow presently. And so he follows him out to the peach orchard, um, and certainly Meade is, is very surprised by what he finds, uh, looking, uh, you would imagine, back towards Little Round Top, because uh, he sends uh, General Governor Kemble Warren back there to to get a view and assess the situation. Um, and I would argue to my dying day that that meeting at the Peach Orchard is probably one of the most awkward conversations in American military history. Um, uh, Sickles asks if, if this move was prudent or should he pull his troops back? And Meade replies, no, sir, the enemy will not let you do that. It's already too late. The battle's <laughs> begun. Um, uh, the other anecdote I really like is, is he, he waves, Meade waves his arm out to the west and says, sir, you might as well move your troops out to that rocky mountain beyond until you find the most advantageous ground you're looking for. But um, it's at that moment that the artillery bombardment is already underway for the Peach Orchard. And Meade's concern is he has no idea how far to the south the Confederate line goes. So he's worried about getting troops into position on little and big round top and on that high ground to the rear. Is there nobody on little round top at this point? At this point, there's some there's sharpshooters down there signal to officers, the south. Signal officers, yep. stations, but, but no infantry or artillery in any force. No major unit. No major unit. So, How does Devil's Den figure into this? 
Well, when Sickles moves forward, you know, think of Sickles as advanced line, almost like a V in the Peach Orchard is kind of the point of that V. Uh, Devil's Den would essentially be the left flank. Uh, you know, it's interesting because Devil's Den is this wild and rugged rock formation uh, that fascinates visitors and some historians alike. In the big picture, Devil's Den doesn't have a huge strategic impact other than the fact that, you know, again, as part of this advanced Sickles line, it's all going to come under attack by Longstreet, and eventually Devil's Den will fall to uh, Confederate forces. But by that time, Union reinforces have gotten onto the more important Little Round Top, which is the higher ground behind yeah. it. Maybe, maybe, maybe you could argue to Devil's Den more famous for the aftermath of the battle. Many of uh, Matthew Brady's team of photographers, uh, when they went there, many of the photos they took were down in that area, so there are a lot of gawkers Water who are coming up the Emmitsburg like Road. Yeah. Yeah. But you, you mentioned earlier in this program that you are both licensed battlefield guides mm -hmm. at Gettysburg. What does that mean? So... Um, it means they give you a badge and we can give tours of the battlefield. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting process. Um, the National Park Service holds the examination about every year to three years, depending on the need for battlefield guides. And um, it can be anywhere from a, a, a year to go through all the stages of the process uh, to as long as you let mm -hmm. it take. Yeah. Unless you're Jim and pass the first oral exam every oh, time. Oh, stop. Uh, 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 me, but thank you. But, Thanks um, for saying that. But it's our job. Uh, as the veterans wanted it yeah, to tell the story that's, that's it. of the Battle of Gettysburg. That, that's exactly it's a privilege. it. Because, you know, sometimes people will come and say, well, wait a minute, why do you need licensed guides at Gettysburg or, frankly, on any battlefield? This was over 100 years ago. This was initially an initiative of the veterans. The veterans, the guys who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg, frankly, didn't want hacks and frauds and unlicensed guides giving visitors bogus information. And that's what you got to remember at the core. The guys who fought in the Battle of Gettysburg wanted this story to be remembered, and they wanted the story to be remembered properly. Yep. And that's why people like us are, are licensed yep. by, the, uh, by the Park Service. So the licensed guides go back that far? So uh, officially, licensed battlefield guides go back to 1916. That's when the first examinations were given uh, by the United States War Department. Um, the National Park Service took over in 1933. Uh, got the jurisdiction for the park and took over that exam process and they still administer it today. What's the test like? <laughs> uh, glad difficult. it's over. Yeah, glad it's over. <laughs> it's, uh, Does it's, it cover everything about the battle? It can, yeah. it can. So it starts with a written exam uh, and it can cover really anything the battle is fair game, general civil war history is fair game, history of the park, uh, National Park Service, anything that they sort of deem could potentially be within scope of a visitor, you know, and the types of questions that a visitor might ask. Uh, so there's a written exam, then if you make it through the written exam, there's the oral examination process where candidates are put in a car with, a, um, with two examiners and basically have to give a mock tour. Now, you might be sitting here listening to this thinking, okay, how hard can it be to give a tour? <laughs> but again, it's, 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 it's a specific skill. It's training. You know, it's telling a story. It's moving it along. It's finishing on time. It's using what we call site relations. You know, a, a very wise guide told me one time that the visitors are not here to see us. They're here to see the battlefield. Okay. So to the extent that we can show them the battlefield, uh, you know, in a reasonable amount of time, makes it, makes it a skill. And you're not going to like this, Jim, but I'm going to be honest. We were kind of lucky because when we went through the uh, exam, it was only a two-tier process. But see, I'm going to disagree with that. <laughs> oh, go on, go on. Go on. <laughs> I'm completely yeah, no, I know, so. Um, there, is, there, is a, there is an interview stage now, and there's a group, yeah. there's a group phase. But I think that speaks to the, to the nature of the exam as it's always been. It's very competitive. Yeah. Uh, there have been people trying to become battlefield guides for a long time. Yeah. And if you some fail people, at any one of those stages, you're... Some people devote their life literally yes. to trying it. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm just, I just want to address that yeah. challenge. <laughs> yeah, sure. The exam process has to be harder it today does. because there is so much more information on the Internet. There's information on the Internet. There's information on social media. There are more Gettysburg books. There's more map books that old timers like us yeah. didn't have when we passed the exam so yeah. dog on it it has to be yeah. harder today because we got to keep the standard <laughs> and, 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 and circling with that back to the whole point of this again it was the veterans wish that this exactly. story was told as accurately exactly. possible so that's, that's what we always got to bring it yep. back to yep. you keep on learning new things all the time all the time oh yeah 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 or relearning things you forgot yes because obviously there's a huge base of knowledge that you need to to pass the exam itself but then over time you realize you know the basic two-hour tour 
with the family of four, you know, on their way to Hershey Park or something, doesn't ask you about 90 percent of what <laughs> right. you've had to learn to pass the exam. So you forget things over time. And yeah, we definitely uh, relearn things that we forgot. But I'll say, too, it's another benefit of writing books about the Battle of Gettysburg, because one of the things then you can do, too, is take topics, dive in deeper and really understand it to a much deeper level than you might have before you started. And that's why there will never come an end to the books on the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War in general. I've, I've always thought about this from the time I was a kid. You know, there are about 165,000 yeah, exactly. soldiers who fight right. here. There are almost a million and a half civilians who are affected by this campaign. Every single one of them has a story. You know, in truth, we we maybe know 30 percent of right. these stories that, that right. are at least in the, in the uh, accessible domain. Uh, and There's always more to find. And even the <laughs> stories we think we know, like Lee versus right. Longstreet, Meade versus Sickles, even the stories we think we know, we're yep. going to argue about because yep. there's a lot of controversy. The veterans argued about this stuff. The veterans debated it. If they couldn't agree on it, uh, I don't know that 150, 160 years later that we're going to get a whole lot closer. But it makes it a compelling story. Well, sure. Do you ever come across different accounts of some specific thing that happened that conflict with each other? And yeah. what do you do then? All the time. <laughs> so... Uh, I think that's one of the advantages of being a licensed battlefield guide is when you have these accounts, we have the ability to go out on the battlefield with that understanding of the terrain and say, well, you know, almost every soldier looks at battle in a vacuum. They see what's in their front. Um, the commanders might have a slightly better view. But using that understanding to parse these accounts and say, well, maybe this guy wasn't actually here, maybe he was a little further in this direction, because it lines up more with the account. But, but using those advantages that we have, understanding the terrain, to say this account makes a lot of sense. Um, there are some yeah. official reports by these officers that you would think they had an aerial drone <laughs> in some places. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of them, too, that don't really line up that well at right. all. Yeah, that's a great um, point. You know, using the terrain is a great point. Yeah. And, you know, it's a combination. Some guys got it wrong because they only saw what was in their immediate focus and obviously you're in combat and the adrenaline is going and, and you're thinking of different things. But there were a, what sometimes we call the fog of war, but mm -hmm. there were also agendas in play too sure. afterwards. And again, that's the type of thing that we like to touch on. You know, the Lee versus Longstreet agendas where people were clearly not always telling the truth to maybe blame one guy for a specific action or in the case of Mead Sickles. So it helps to have multiple accounts trying to describe the same action. And to Britt's point, you can kind of say, OK, knowing the terrain, what makes sense, but also, too, if I have three accounts that say this and one account that says this, you know, then you kind of use the, the preponderance yep. of the evidence. Uh, sickles aside, uh, do you have a favorite character in this book or a, a favorite unsung <laughs> hero? Uh, you sure, I'll go first. So uh, one of the things we're proud of with the book, because really no full-length treatment of the peach orchard has ever been done before, so we feel like there's a number of stories in this book that uh, either have not been told or have not been told in great detail before. Um, you know, I'm not going to say unsung hero, because this guy would definitely not qualify as a <laughs> hero. Uh, but there's another officer in the Excelsior Brigade, a guy from New York by the name of Colonel John Austin, uh, who, like Sickles, had a similar background, had come out of Tammany Hall, uh, had been incarcerated for murder on one at least one occasion. I think there were multiple. Uh, and just a real scoundrelly sort of scumbag, uh, you know, because we think of historical figures as marble men and that they didn't do things. And I found the I found the Austin story both humorous and uh, and well amusing because it's sort of sickles on a smaller scale. But yeah. you kind of think how many New Yorkers could be at the peach orchard who were tried for murder? And apparently there's more than two. <laughs> so figure that out. Well, so to, to, to counterbalance this, I'm going to give you a marble man. Uh, the, the first book project I did on the 105th one of my Civil War heroes would, would have to be Colonel Calvin Craig of the 105th Pennsylvania. Um, growing up, watching the movie Glory, great movie, by the way. You can see it now on its 30th anniversary, I guess, yeah. on the big screen. Um, but um, Robert Gould Shaw, the colonel of that movie, the first black regiment that, that goes into combat, the 54th, uh, was the model northern civilian at the time, anti-slavery, uh, uh, completely on board with, with equality for everybody. Well, when I did research on that as a, as a young person, I learned that not all of those traits were accurate, and it was very disappointing. So when I first started researching the 105th Pennsylvania, their Colonel Calvin Craig embodied every one of those attributes that 
I thought <laughs> that Robert Gould Shaw uh, had in the movie, and it was hard not to kind of uh, want to keep digging further and further. I mean, there's a lot of guys like that, yeah, too. You know, there's yeah, there's a lot of guys we cover in the book. Freeman McGilvery, yeah. Ed Bailey of the 2nd New Hampshire, um, Ames, the Battery Commanders. Benjamin just, Humphreys, yeah, 21st Mississippi. Yeah, yeah uh, great example. William Barksdale, regardless of causes or, or why they're fighting, you know. Right. You see the best and the worst in these people in these most desperate times. Yeah. Um, and once we, once we got beyond the Longstreet and the Sickles stories, which were important to tell, but once we got beyond that, we wanted to make sure that we could tell the stories of as many of these guys as possible. Yep. What's it like digging through all these records? Uh, you know, one of the benefits I think we have being at Gettysburg and being Battlefield Guides is obviously we have access to the, um, uh, to the various archives that are available. You know, you probably want to start with the official, in most cases, you want to start with the official reports, uh, which for the most part, more or less every officer would file after a battle. And that will give you kind of a baseline to work with, and those are available. Uh, but then from there, it's, yeah, digging into the archives, finding letters, finding diaries, uh, newspapers accounts you know today over the last 10 to 15 years I would say that the digitiz digitization of newspaper yeah, archives sure. has greatly increased and improved the ability to find sort of these hidden gems uh, that for many years you know you would have to go to a specific archive and do sort of one of these dusty you know microfilm reels <laughs> to find uh, the digitization of newspapers I think is one of the reasons why we currently have you know an, a, another explosion of Civil War literature because yeah. people are finding just a lot of great stuff in newspapers that before was um, was lost. And 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 I would say to that, it, it we're very lucky when you compare, you know, the work that we're able to do today to, to authors, researchers mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. Um, it's still overwhelming, though. You know, when we first started talking about this book, we were like, well, you've done a lot of work on yeah. sickles. I've done a lot of work around the orchard with the Pennsylvania units there. This should be a breeze. <laughs> well, three years later. <laughs> yeah, we certainly, he's right. You're right. We certainly thought it would come together easier than it did. And I think that's telling to the complexity of the story. You yeah. know, at the end of the day, when you combine both armies, possibly as many as 5,000 guys fight in and around the Sherfee property, the mm -hmm. Peach Orchard and the Emmitsburg Road. I mean, it's 5,000 guys. Yep. And so, again, yeah, to find all those stories and, and, and to find all those accounts at times felt overwhelming sure. because there were so many of them and because it could be potentially be so confusing. Yep. So when last we left the battle, uh, Sickles and his troops had moved up to the Peach Orchard and, and uh, Longstreet and the Confederates were coming up Emmitsburg Road. Sort of approaching. They, mm -hmm. So when last we left, Longstreet was approaching Sickles' Emmitsburg Road position. Ultimately, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Longstreet's attack begins. Now, because of Sickle, Sickles' position, instead of Longstreet going up the Emmitsburg Road like this, Longstreet's attack essentially starts to flow in a, in a different direction towards Little Round Top, towards Devil's Den, towards the wheat field. Eventually, give or take around 5.30, 6 o'clock at night, Longstreet's attack is going to slam into the Peach Orchard, uh, spearheaded by the attack of a uh, Mississippi brigade under General William Barksdale. But after some uh, somewhat brief but relatively fierce fighting in and around the Peach Orchard, Barksdale's guys are going to break open that V. They're going to break it open more or less crush Sickles' peach orchard position, and then the two sides now are going to fight almost step by step, trying to get back towards uh, Cemetery Ridge. So eventually Sickles and his men will lose the peach orchard but, and the Emmitsburg Road, but they don't give it up without a fight. Why were the Confederates able to do that, to push back Sickles? And Quite simply, with, with, a, with the way a Civil War battle line is set up tactically, it's hard enough to fight in one direction just because everybody's shooting in that same direction. So. When Sickles creates this salient, not only does he have to cover at least two different directions, but um, a lot of maps of the Peach Orchard this day show just a contiguous salient line. Really, there are gaps all over the place. And so as the Confederates make their attack from south to north, eventually hitting the orchard, these soldiers in the Peach Orchard are trying to turn uh, to face each of these threats. And it gets to the point where you can't fight people on your left and your right at the same time. So as they shift troops into that salient, they open up a gap, and it happens to be right when Barksdale's brigade is coming across the field, and one regiment comes steamrolling right through there, and that just opens it up. It's like uh, the parting of the seas. Um, so now you've got really 
several different micro battles happening within this one right. action. Um, you know, if you ask one of the brigades out there, Charles Graham's brigade, if you ask a Pennsylvanian uh, on the left side of that line what their experience was like, it's completely different than the experience the soldiers fighting in and around the Sherfy farm had. Not only is the ground different, but they're uh, facing different obstacles, each and every one of them. Um, and once, once they split it open, another Confederate brigade steps off and they come steamrolling right through there. There's no way that these Union soldiers can reconcile that difference and, and try to bridge the gap. You know, and if I could, although earlier it might have sounded like we were somewhat empathetic to Sickles and his, his confusion, we're not Sickles apologists. Uh, at the end of the day, to that challenge that he has defending this V is he's too spread out. Yep. And as Britt said, Confederate attacks are going to exploit gaps and, and help make that line collapse. But also, too, because Sickles is so spread out and he's drawing on reinforcements from different parts of the field, uh, the Yankees, the Union troops there, have a, an enormously difficult command and control challenge mm -hmm. because they've got regiments from all different parts of the field trying to um, um, put this together. Compare and contrast that with Barksdale's men, who are enormous who are exceptionally well led, and that also contributes to the uh, the Union failure at the uh, to defend the Peach Orchard. And, and, and that's a key with every battle, but even maybe more specifically at the Peach Orchard. So many commanders are going down. I mean, Sickles himself goes down with a wound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, on the Confederate side, regimental commanders are dropping like flies once they come across that field. So everybody down that chain of command has to bump up a step uh, in the chaos and. Kind of like we said with with these folks generally before, you see the best and the worst in people. Not everybody has the ability to rise to the occasion and not everybody steps up. Fill that fill that void. Um, so it creates a number of interesting situations. You'll have you know certain regiments fighting around the Sherfy buildings, and the the din of battle is so loud that even as their line officers are trying to shout for them to get out of the building, you know the guys on their left and right they're already gone. Um, it's it's far too late. Um, but uh, it's, it's the same problem the Confederates have, because as their officers are going down, um, what is the objective? We've smashed this line open. Yeah. Um, we've captured the, the ground we thought we were supposed to capture. And out here to our front, there's still Yankee soldiers. There's artillery out there on the next ridge over. Well, I guess we keep going forward. And um, as spread out as the Union soldiers are in the vicinity of the Peach Orchard, you could also argue that... Um, they take a lot of wind out of the sails of this Confederate attack. Um, if, if they were anything but, but veteran soldiers, who knows how this might have played out. Right, um, right. So. Yeah, that's a great point. And ultimately, the conclusion that we come to is that the action in and around the Peach Orchard ultimately does not benefit either army. Mm -mm. It's relatively obvious that it disrupts General Meade's defense, and I think most people can kind of get that. But on the Confederate side, this disruption that we've talked about, taking the wind out of Longstreet's sails, so to speak, you know, that line of sickles is uh, essentially acts as almost a buffer or a shock absorber, and Longstreet is going to suffer heavy casualties taking Devil's Den, the wheat field, the peach orchard, ground that will ultimately prove meaningless to the Confederates in their attempt to win the battle of Gettysburg. And that's an important point, because people got to kind of remember, Sickles did, for whatever his faults, and yes, folks, he has faults, but for whatever Sickles' faults, he did not lose the battle of Gettysburg. Right. General Meade still wins, and Robert E. Lee still loses, and the Peach Orchard plays a part in that outcome. But, well, we yeah. did a, a book show recently on the uh, 50th <coughs> anniversary reunion oh, of the yeah, soldiers yeah. at Gettysburg, yeah. and they said at that 50th anniversary reunion, General Sickles showed up, and he said, I am the reason we won the Battle of Gettysburg. He's, I alone. he's the star, yeah. Yeah, sort <laughs> of. I mean, you know, he was a star with these veterans, for the remainder of his life, and it culminates. It culminates in his return visit at the. Uh, As was Longstreet. Yeah, you that's know. what I was going to mention. Yep. You know, you know, one of the stories we enjoy doing in our book is sort of, you know, what becomes my favorite Civil War bromance is the the <laughs> the afterward relationship between Longstreet and Sickles. These former enemies have common ground. Longstreet's being criticized by some of his former colleagues. You know, the Sickles controversy. He's being criticized, and these two guys really, really coming to coming to. Uh, coming together to try to mutually support each other. And there's yep. some great drinking stories, yeah. you know, about these two guys going back and forth. Yep. You know, Longstreet, apologize for shooting my leg off. And Longstreet says, apologize, you should thank me for giving you one leg to stand on.
hand on. <laughs> and it was stuff like that that, you know, yep. these guys just bantered back and forth for the remainder of their lives. Yep. So how was it, and we might not have enough time to address this, how was it that what happened at the Peach Orchard affected the decision to go ahead with uh, Pickett's Charge? Pickett's Charge, yeah. So at the end of the day, when the second day ends, Longstreet and his men have captured the Peach Orchard, they've captured the Emmitsburg Road, but Cemetery Ridge is still in Union control. What Lee says in his report when looking at July 3rd is that what he calls these partial successes convinced him to try to renew the attack for another day. And that, again, the ground gained at the Peach Orchard would, in his opinion, be successfully used by his artillery to help support what we know as Pickett's Charge. Remember, Pickett's Charge is an infantry assault, but it's also a massive artillery assault. That artillery assault happens in large part because Lee thinks the Peach Orchard will be the ground from which he can draw fire onto um, Cemetery Ridge. So, so, so the had he not had that, he might not have been able to, to do that. The Confederates stayed overnight uh, from the second to they, the third on yep they bivouac right the in, the, in the peach orchard um kershaw's brigade is there of south carolinians um and it's a pretty shattered brigade uh, the mississippians are still there um the good news is they can attend to some of their wounded but as they roll the artillery out on the morning of july the third um and the sun comes up um they start to attract the attention of the Union line, uh, you know, and telling the story of the Scherfee family, that's another important note to make. They lose their barn as Confederates begin yeah. firing on Cemetery Ridge, the Union counter battery fire. Uh, shell comes in, lights the barn on fire with wounded soldiers inside of it, uh, and, and up it goes. And um, really, uh, as much of an opportunity as it appeared for the Confederates to maybe have a converging fire on Cemetery Ridge, and you could argue this one way or the other, uh, the bombardment itself is largely ineffective for the most part along Cemetery Ridge. Um, I think people are sometimes hard on the Confederates too, the, the infantry specifically when it comes to attacking, who in their right mind would make a direct assault across that open field? First of all, during the Civil War, it's direct assault or flank attack. The flank attack had failed, and it's a matter of concentrating your fire, and the Confederates thought they had concentrated their fire. They don't have a reason to believe that they're going to lose. They've never lost before under the uh, generalship of Robert E. Lee. And uh, Lee obviously believed it would be successful or else he wouldn't have made the attack that right, day. Right. Uh, so, Were the Sherfies able to go back to their land and grow peaches? They, they do. Uh, they, they come back to their farm largely wrecked. There are burials all over the place. Um, but they do get the peach orchard growing again. Mm -hmm. And um, they filed damage claims a number of times in the, uh, in the years after the war, which produced nothing. They don't, they don't receive any payment. But the, the bit of good news is that as these veterans come back, not only are they talking about what happened to them during the battle, retelling stories, but when they go home, now the Sherfies have this walking advertisement going off to every state. So it's in good the, for business. It's good so for business. To sell, sell peaches. Oh. Ultimately, ultimately yeah. they, we kind of feel like ultimately and ironically, they lose their land really yes. to tourism and preservation. Right. Because they, although they're getting visitors, they also talk about the land being trampled, the crops being trampled by visitors, and eventually it becomes preserved in, in property of Gettysburg National it, Military Park. There are no winners in this story, right. it which looks is like kind of what makes it almost a tragedy. It initially looks like a happy yeah. ending for them, but the rug yeah. gets pulled out, yep. um, like everybody else. Yeah, so. and not yeah, not to spoil it for readers, but yeah. it's kind of a bittersweet ending yeah. for everybody involved. Yeah. So, if you go there today, what do you see? Well, if you go there today, you see trees, but you don't see nearly as many trees that were here during the battles. Are they growing peaches there now? They, they are, are. In, in part of it, in part of yep. it. There's there's a larger part of the orchard today that that they're not growing um, trees on. But the Sherfy House and the and a uh, uh, rebuilt Sherfy Barn are um, jewels of Gettysburg National Military yep. Park today. The house is beautiful, and um, um, so that's still there. Well, I wish we could keep going, but we are out of time. We yeah. are speaking <laughs> with James Hessler and Britt Eisenberg. They are the co-authors of this book, Gettysburg's Peach Orchard, Longstreet, Sickles, and the Bloody Fight for the Commanding Ground Along the Emmitsburg Road. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for, you having us. for having us. Appreciate it. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Full episodes of PA Books, as well as other PCN programs, are available to stream with the PCN app. Visit PCNTV.com or the App Store for details.